I would like to welcome you to Lecture 7, Part 2, on the topic of photosynthesis of the light reaction. This lecture is part of the subject plant physiology, which is a component of the Bachelor of Agriculture and Technology, a degree that is offered at the North Melbourne Institute of TAFE. Please visit our website www.nmit.edu.au for information on this course and other courses that we offer. My name is Dr Nikki Cooley. In this first part of the subject, we will be looking at different physiological aspects of plants by travelling through them in a sort of journey. I'd like you to ensure that you have watched all the lectures that you need to before you watch this lecture. That's lectures 1 to lecture 6 and lecture 7 part 1. In Lecture 7, Part 2, we will be looking specifically at the energy production component of the light reaction. Please ensure that you have completed all the DIY practicals, associated and essential readings, as well as the Moodle quizzes. We will start this lecture by looking in some detail about the molecule ATP and its conversion to ADP. This is part of the conversion of energy. How do electrons in the electron train reactions, how are they able to convert to chemical energy? We will then spend the second part of this lecture looking at the light reaction and the significance to agriculture. So, let's start by looking at some of the compounds. The compound on your screen, top left hand side, is ATP, or also known as adenosine triphosphate. This is a very important compound for life on Earth. The left hand side shows the chemical formula and structure. The right hand side is a modelled illustration of this structure. ATP is produced from the compound adenosine diphosphate or ADP. This is illustrated below. The image on the screen shows both the molecular construction of adenosine triphosphate ATP and adenosine diphosphate. You will notice the commonalities of these molecules. The adenine part, which is on the left hand side, is identical. The ribose part in the middle is similar, but the diphosphate part and the triphosphate part of these two molecules are different. Essentially, diphosphate means there are two phosphate groups attached to the carbon chain, while triphosphate means there are three carbon groups attached to the triphosphate chain. And it is in fact the loss of a phosphate which is the exchange of energy. So let us look at this reaction in some detail. ADP is said to be in the oxidized form. If you add an inorganic phosphate to ADP, you produce ATP, and this is said to be in the reduced form. It is said to be in the reduced form, just as the word describes, in that it is in a form that can be reduced while ADP is said to be in the oxidised form because it is in a state that can be oxidised. It is important to remember that the construction of an atom consists of the nuclei, electrons and protons and it is the movement of these electrons which aids the addition and reduction of these compounds. The process of generating ATP is called cyclic photophosphorylation as it uses light directly to generate the ATP. The energised electrons cycle through an electron transport chain and return to the original chloroform form. This is a true cycle. Cyclic photophosphorylation takes place in the thylakoid membrane of the chloroplast. It is important to know that photosystem 2 is not involved in cyclic photophosphorylation. During photosynthesis in plants, there are two photosystems, photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. 
The terminology of these is slightly confusing as they were named after the order they were discovered in and not the order of the reaction. Therefore, the reaction starts with photosystem 2 and then goes to photosystem 1. In the capture of light energy, a number of centers in the membrane called photosystems work in a chain-like manner. Electrons excited out of the reaction center in the photosystems are carried along a chain. The chain pumps proteins, just like the respiratory complexes, and the electrons are eventually dumped onto a compound called NADP, which is converted into another form, NADPH. Photons flow back through the ATP synthase, generating ATP. This is a summary of photosynthesis. So let's look at this summary in a little bit more detail using a diagram. The process of the light reaction is referred to as the Z scheme. And then this is followed by the non-light requiring or Kelvin cycle. In this figure, we have a representation of both the Z scheme and the Kelvin cycle and how they interact. So let us start from the beginning. Light hits photosystem 2. The energy from this light enables the splitting of water and the electron to pass down the electron transport train. The electron is energized again by light in the photosystem 1 and the compound NADPH is produced from NADP. While this reaction is occurring, hydrogen ions are binding up in the thylakoid membrane. The only direction they can travel is through a complex called ATP synthase. Once they pass through this, they will produce ATP. ATP synthase is not illustrated on this diagram. The NADP and ADP is then used for energy in the Calvin cycle which allows the production of sugars. Here is another visualization of this process. It demonstrates the role of the redox potential in this reaction. Water is split in photosystem 2 using light as a wavelength of P680 nanometers. This excites the electron, where it is transported along the electron train to photosystem 1. This time in photosystem 1, more light energy, but at a slightly different wavelength, that is 700 nanometers, is excited. And then the electron can be used to convert NADP into NADPH. This occurs in the organ called the stroma, where it is then immediately available for use as an energy source in the Kelvin cycle. The photosynthesis systems are comprised of antenna pigment molecules where energy is passed from one antenna to another. Ferrodoxin, FD, is an example. The hydrogen ions that have been pumped into the thylakoid membrane space can pass down a concentration gradient through the ATP synthase complexes. As the ions pass through the symplanes complex, their chemostatic energy is released. This slide and the visual representation upon it shows how the Z scheme and the Kelvin scheme interact. The Z scheme is that of the light reactions while the Kelvin scheme is that of the dark reactions although techn technically the terminology dark is no longer used. We prefer to say it's non-light requiring. You can see that in the light reactions, NADP is converted to ATP. In this conversion, water is used and oxygen is released. In the dark reactions, NADP is broken down from NADPH. But as this breakdown occurs, Carbohydrates are formed, releasing carbon dioxide. As you may have realized, light is an essential component of the light reactions of photosynthesis. 
and it has certain properties which are summarized in this diagram. You can see that the type of radiation, light, lies between the ultraviolet and the infrared spectrum and that this spectrum is related to energy. Therefore, there is more energy at the 400 than there is at the 700 end of the spectrum. It is the interaction of light and the pigments in photosynthesis which enable these reactions to occur. Let us talk about one of these pigments, chlorophyll. This is probably the most important molecule in the light reaction. On the left hand side of the screen you will see the molecular formula for chlorophyll and as I'm sure you can see it is a very complicated compound. On the right hand side of the screen you can see what's called an action spectrum of chlorophyll A. Action spectrums are visualizations of where light is absorbed. You will see that chlorophyll A absorbs light mostly at 4 to 9 nanometers and then again at 659. Areas between 5 and 600 nanometers are hardly absorbed at all and areas above 700 and 400 are also not absorbed. Chlorophyll absorbs molecules as individual photons. Each can cause a single photochemical reaction. If there is no direct photochemical reaction, chlorophyll may lose its excitation energy as heat and red fluorescence. So this is a waste basically. A fluorescence, in fluorescence, a high energy or short wavelength photon is absorbed, which promotes an electron. The electron then drops to the lowest vibrational substate of the excited state. So this is the technical chemical terms for what is going on. Once the electron has fallen, it releases heat, and then it drops to its ground state, emitting a photon of lower energy or longer wavelength than was originally absorbed. So what does all this mean? Well, put simply, it means that chlorophyll A absorbs solar radiation in only small regions of the light spectrum. In the figure on the slide, you will see the solar output from the sun. You will see the amount of energy in red that hits the Earth's surface, and then finally in green you will see the amount of absorption by chlorophyll. Chlorophyll absorbs strongly in the blue and the red regions. Green light is not efficiently absorbed and thus reflected into our eyes, giving plants their characteristic green colour, although there is some debate about the colour. Chlorophyll absorbs light and then it goes into a higher energy state. When it's in this higher energy, or it's often referred to as excited state, it is extremely unstable, and it is this characteristic which allows the chlorophyll to give up the energy so readily to its surroundings as heat. There are four alternative pathways for disposing of its energy. It can re-emit a photon, and this is called fluorescence. It can convert the photon energy into heat. It may participate in energy transfer. Remember, energy is never lost, it's only transferred. Or fourthly, energy causes a chemical reactions to occur, and this is photochemistry. Chlorophyll A, which we have been talking about, is one photosynthetic pigment, but there are others. Chlorophyll B is another photosynthetic pigment, and so are the carotenoid pigments. On your slide, you will see some molecular structures of these compounds. Energy of sunlight is absorbed by pigments of the plant. Chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B are abundant in green plants. There are also chlorophyll C and D, and these are found in protists and cyanobacteria. All chlorophylls have what's called a poropyrene-like ring structure with a magnesium atom and a long hydrocarbon tail. Carotenoid pigments, another set of photosynthetic pigments, are all linear molecules with multiple double bonds. For example, carotene is an example of a carotenoid pigment. 
Carotenes transfer their light energy to chlorophyll, thus known as accessory pigments. Action spectrums are very useful to photobiologists. They show the magnitude of response of a biological system, and it can be any system, to light as a function of wavelength. In the image, we have an action spectrum. This is showing the chromophore pigment responsible for light absorption. And it also shows where the light is being absorbed. You can see from this figure that between 400 and 500 nanometers, light is being used. And again, between 650 and 690. Quantum efficiency is nearly 100%. Almost all absorbed photons, photons engage in photochemistry. If quantum efficiency was less, then less photons would be engaged in photosynthesis, phot photochemistry. Energy efficiency is about 27%. It's only a fourth of the energy is stored, the remainder is converted to heat, and this is waste. Here is another example on the slide of an action spectrum. This action spectrum is of a, a response of the plant Bellis perennis, commonly known as daisy. On the axes, you have relative quantum efficiency and wavelength. This action spectrum is showing that there is a 10% inhibition of photosynthetic rate at wavelengths of radiation that are in the UV spectrum. This demonstrates that light can not only um, in, uh, promote photosynthesis, but certain regions of light can inhibit photosynthetic rate. This is important in agriculture to understand how light can alter photosynthetic rates. In light harvesting complex, the majority of pigments serve as an antennae complex, collecting light and transferring energy to the reaction centre complex. To understand this process, it is important to know that only one molecule of oxygen is produced for each 2,500 chloroform molecules in the same sample. Thus, several hundred pigments associated with each reaction center. It's very complex. Each reaction center must operate four times to produce one mole of oxygen. Therefore, in summary, 2,500 chlorophylls per oxygen. The process of these photosynthetic centres is very complex. On the screen in front of you, there is a model visualisation of a pigment arrangement from Photosystem 2. The pigment molecules are arranged in blocks of about mm -hmm. 50, and these are the antennae. These channel energy to a centre chlorophyll A molecule, the reaction centre, where the photochemical reactions occurs. The excited chlorophyll A ejects an electron, becoming an extremely strong oxidizing agent capable of pulling electrons out of the water. The antennae plus the reaction center taken together are termed as the photosystem. This is another model of one antennae structure. I have shown this so you can see the complexities of the molecules that make up these centres. Photosynthesis has some interesting characteristics. When red and far red light are given together, the rate of photosynthesis is greater than the sum of the individual rates, and this is called the enhancement effect. It is explained by the discovery that there are two photosystem complexes, photosystem 1 and photosystem 2, and that they operate together to carry out these reactions. As we said previously, photosystem 1 prefers the absorption of far red, while photosystem 2 prefers the absorption of red light at 680 nanometers. Also differences is that photosystem 2 produces a strong reductant and a weak oxidant. Photosystem 2 produces a strong oxidant and a weak reductant. So how are Photosystem 1 and Photosystem 2 organised? Well, predominantly they're located in the grammar lamina. Lam Photosystem 1 and ATP synthase are found almost exclusively in the stroma laminae and at the edges of the grammar laminae. 
the cytochrome BF complex is very distributed. Thus, the two photochemical events that occur are spatially separated. In the figure on your slide, you can see a visual representation of this arrangement. Spatial separation implies that one or more electron carriers must diffuse from the grana to the stroma to deliver electrons to photosystem 1. In this, two com molecules are, are contributing, plastocinin, plastocyanin and plastoquinine. In photosystem 2, oxidation of two water molecules in total produces four electrons, four protons and one oxygen molecule. The protons must also diffuse to the stroma where ATP is synthesized. Function to deliver energy efficiency to the electron centers is quite important. So let's see what these factors are. Size varies considerably. You have about 20 to 30 pigments per reaction center in photosynthetic bacteria. 200 to 300 per center in higher plants. Several thousands in algae and some other bacteria. Mechanism of excitation energy transfer from pigments to the reaction center is called the fluorescence resonance energy transfer or F. RET. Important differences between energy transfer among pigments and electron transfer that occurs in the electron center. Phenophyton is a chlorophyll with two hydrogens and no magnesium and it is an early acceptor of electrons in photosystem 2. Electrons from photosystem 2 are passed to a complex of two plastoquinines PQA and PQB, which are bound to the reaction center. In this figure, you can see a visual represent representation of the functional role of PQ and PQH2. PQB becomes reduced to PQB2 and takes two protons from the stroma, yielding a fully reduced plastohydroquinine. It dissociates from the reaction center and transfers its electrons to the cytochrome PF complex. Take some time to have a look at the image on this screen as it shows the excited state of pigments. The excited state of pigments increase with the distance that they occur from the reaction center. Put simply, if a pigment is closer to the reaction center, it is lower in energy. This ensures that the excitation transfer in energy uh, in energetically terms is favorable. Some energy loses heat. This is about 95 to 99% of all energy. This is both a problem for the plant and possibly for agriculture, as it does show that not only does the plant have to deal with extra heat, but it also is not as efficient as it might be. So let's bring all this together. Almost all the processes that make up the light reactions are carried out by four major protein complexes. There is photosystem 2, cytochrome BF, photosystem 1 and ATP synthase. In summary, photosystem 2 oxidizes water to oxygen in the thylakoid lumen and releases protons into the lumen. The cytochrome BF oxidizes plastohydroquinine and delivers electrons to photosystem 1. Photosystem 1 reduces NADP plus to NADPH in the stroma through the ferrodoxin and FNR complex. ATP synthase produces ATP as protons which diffuse back through into the lumen into the stroma. On this slide we have a visual representation of the mechanics of the electron transport chain. So let us start at photosystem 2. Water is split with the aid of light which is absorbed at 680 nanometers. The photon released is involved in the plastoquinine this photon is then used in the cytochrome B6F complex. It is recycled back into the plastinquinine complex where it can be used again to plastocyanin.
the photons from plastocyanin can be used for ferrodoxine and FNR to produce NADP from NADPH. Again, light is used in this process at 700 nanometers in photosystem 1. In the lumen, a buildup of hydrogen ions from the splitting of water during um, oxidation in photosystem 2 builds up, and this is then used and pumped through the ATPase protein, which is the set of specialized protein embedded in the membrane that can convert NADP to ATP. You will note most importantly that the electrochemical potential gradient is high in the lumen and low in the stroma. This is very important in the process of this hydrogen pump. So two molecules of water are oxidized in the photosystem 2 complex. This releases oxygen, four molecules of hydrogen, and four electrons. Water is a very stable compound, thus it is difficult to oxidize. The photosynthetic oxygen evolving complex is the only known system on earth that carries out this reaction. Magnesium is an essential cofactor in this process. Experiments have shown that chlorine and calcium ions are also essential for the evolution of oxygen. In this large complex, PQH2 is oxidized and one of the electrons is passed towards photosystem 2, while the other cycles to increase the number of protons pumped across the membrane. The first electron is transferred to the plastocyanin, which reduces the oxidized P700 nanometers center of photosystem 1. The plastos then equinine transfers its electron and releases two proteins to the lumen. A second complex, PQH2, is oxidized. One electron transferred to photosystem 1 and one electron is transferred to the plasmomycoquinine or PQH2 while picking up two photons from the stroma. This is a more detailed visualisation of Photosystem 1 Reaction Centre. The Photosystem 1 Reaction Centre contains a core of about 100 chlorophylls and as a core antennae. They form a bowl-like structure surrounding the electron transfer cofactors. Extremely strong reducing agents make up the unstable and difficult to identify. Electron acceptors include iron sulfur proteins, which transfer electrons to ferrodoxine, also called FD, where they are used by FNR to reduce NAD plus to NADPH, thus completing the sequence of non-cyclic electron transport that began with the oxidization of water. ATP synthase is quite an interesting process. It is also known as photophosphorylation and it works via ke uh, chemoosmosis. The basic principle is that the ion concentration differences and the electropotential differences across membranes provide a strong source of energy. This process is called the proton motive force and it powers the ATP synthase. On the slide you can see a visual representation of this process. You can visualize the hydrogen ions from the lumen passing through the ATP synthase via the CFO complex through into the stroma. NADP plus inorganic phosphate enables the production of ATP. We have been exploring now in some detail the mechanisms of photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. And as you will appreciate, they are extremely complicated. So what happens when they go wrong and how does the plant avoid this? Protection and repair of photo damage consists of something called quenching and heat dissipation. It involves the neutralizing of toxic photo products and the synthetic repair of photosystem too. We have a diagram that sums up this on the slide. This process is really important in agriculture as it reduces photosynthetic efficiencies which can result in reductions of yield. It can also cause significant damage to the plant when this process goes wrong. 
This process can go wrong with a lack of water or in high temperatures. It can also go wrong in very low temperatures. So why is this so important to agriculture? Why have we spent so much time learning photosynthesis in such detail? Well, put simply, photosynthesis evolved from prokaryotes. Pro it was initially evolved in low light conditions in the absence of oxygen. And this may allow for improvements in yield for crops grown in high light conditions. It's a very important aspect of most agronomy in Australia. Photosystem 2 can be damaged by high concentrations of a substrate light. This has been shown by several researchers, including Nishima et al. in 2011 and Murieta in 2012. Photo damaged plants have had to develop a whole set of regulatory, regulatory and protective responses, and these include processes that dis dissipate excess excitation energy as heat and allow for the rapid repair and turnover of photodamaged photosystem 2 subunits. So does this mean that we can improve photosynthesis? Does this mean that we can reduce photodamage? These two questions are very important and have been the subject of breeding and genetic engineering. Here we have table 1 from a paper that was looking at the process of photosynthetics and if we can improve efficiencies for agriculture. In this summary or review paper, there were certain components of each of the photosynthetic reactions which were believed could be studied in more detail to improve photosynthetic efficiencies. Where research shows us there's great potential for improving photosynthesis and possibly yield, it also opens up the question, so what is the significance of agriculture in the future? One of the future's biggest challenges will be climate change and climate change adaptation. In the figure here we can see some modelling which shows the percentage change of different crops in, climate, in the future in certain climate scenarios. As yield is driven by photosynthesis and water availability is very important in photosynthesis, you may now begin to understand the impact of some of these findings. I'd like you, when you finish this lecture, to please watch the following video. Photosynthesis, a crash course of biology. Please take notes on this video and insert into your lecture notes here. The essential reading for part two of this lecture is the same as part one. Please ensure you complete the chapter on photosynthesis, the light reaction, from the recommended Tays and Zyger 2010 Plant Physiology 5th edition textbook. So, let us review some of the key components that we have learnt about photosynthesis. In both parts 1 and 2, you have begun to realise some of the complexity that involves the, the capture of light energy and conversion into chemical energy. Please note that while we have gone into some detail, there is yet another level of detail that has not been presented in these notes. Science is moving forward and new findings about photosynthesis are being discovered all of the time. One of the most important components in photosynthesis is how water is used. The water that is absorbed by the roots and translocated via the xylem into, xylem into the leaves has two roots. It can be absorbed into the atmosphere via transpiration, a process you have learnt all about now, or a small percentage of it is used in the photosynthetic reactions. The water is split. It is split into pure oxygen and hydrogen ions using the energy from the sun. The oxygen is released and the hydrogen protons are moved into the chloroplasts. The hydrogen protons are packed into the thylakoids in, an, in the grana. The hydrogen protons leave the thylakoids through the ATP synthase, which is a cyclic reaction. ATP synthase turns ADP into ATP with the addition of an inorganic phosphate. 
Carbon dioxide is a gas from the atmosphere that is absorbed by the leaves. ATP is used to combine carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and hydrogen into the compound glucose. Functions of glucose are that it is used to store energy or it is used to combine to make other sugars or compounds. When sugar is utilised by the mitochondria, carbon dioxide and water are released and absorbed by the plants. This brings us to the end of the topic of light reaction of photosynthesis.